Good evening. Welcome to the Monday, September 16th, 2024 City Council meeting at 6.30 p.m. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Ash. Councilor Campbell. Present. Councilor Devine. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor McCarthy. Present. Councilor Minton. Present. President Kane. Present. Councilor Ash. You have nine members. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, please stand if you're able for a moment of silence. Please use this moment as you will. Please turn to the flag for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the, the United, United States, States of America. America. And, and to the, the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, please read the open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Thank you. Madam Clerk, first item on the agenda. Number one, 2024-112, order acceptance of the HERO Act, adoption of this act, relative to honoring, empowering, and recognizing our service members and the veterans. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, tonight, you're going to, John, you're going to deliver a presentation? No? Yeah. Pardon? Oh, first we're going to start with Councilor Ash. One more. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it brings me uh, great joy to work with uh, the mayor and the administration to bring um, this ordinance to the council and to, to this body and to the city uh, tonight. As many of you um, listening here in the audience or listening at home, or as certainly my colleagues, um, remember that on August 8th, Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll signed um, what is the acronym for the HERO Act um, into law in the state of Massachusetts. Um, there are a number of key um, items and issues discussed um, in, in the envelope pushed forward to honor veterans in the HERO Act. Um, and one of those which we're going to be discussing and um, adopting tonight, hopefully, will be um, a tax exemption for veterans. So um, I understand we're going to have um, Director Mason and the financial team go over what that looks like for the city. Um, there are two key citations in the HERO Act that amend Mass General Laws um, to provide a um, tax exemption uh, relative to a cost of living increase and also essentially doubling that tax exemption for veterans. So look forward to the discussion. And again, um, brings me uh, great pleasure to bring this to the body. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. And I believe. Uh, Mr. Walker would like to. Yes. Speak. President recognized to Mr. Walker. Thank you through you, Mr. President. Um, this evening, I first want to thank um, this body over the course of the last many years for its uh, ongoing and really truly unprecedented support of our city's veterans. Um, this group together with the mayor, um, I don't think there's another community uh, in the Commonwealth that does as much for our veterans uh, than the city of Quincy does. Um, and this is another uh, opportunity for us to uh, do our part. Um, and this council has been uh, with uh, every step of the way on, on that. Um, and hopefully, um, we'll get this implemented this evening. I do want to recognize in the audience tonight our great Veteran Services Director, Christine Cugini. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention also Governor Haley, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll, our state legislative delegation for making uh, this part of the HERO Act uh, such a priority. Uh, with that, Mr. President, um, we have two presenters to go over the details and then the financial implications to the city for these local options. Uh, we're gonna start with Chief Assessor and Chairman of the Board of Assessors, John Rowland, and he'll hand it off to uh, Director of Municipal Finance, uh, Eric Mason. So with your pleasure, with your permission, hand it over to Mr. Rowland. Thank you. Point. Yeah. We've got to hold this tonight. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, I always say 
administrating the exemptions for both our veterans and our seniors is the most rewarding aspect of the role as an assessor. So I'm, I'm happy to be here tonight to discuss some increasing exemption amounts for our veterans. With the recently signed HERO Act, cities and towns in Massachusetts have the option to provide greater assistance to veterans who live in our community. Section 23 of the HERO Act adds two new veteran property tax exemption clauses, Sorry. Clause 22I and Clause 22J to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 59, Section 5, which is a statute that establishes local property tax exemptions for individuals and organizations. Both new clauses are local options that must be accepted by a city or town to apply in that municipality. Clause 22I would increase the amount of the tax exemption granted to veterans on their domiciles under current veteran exemption clauses annually by a cost of living adjustment determined by the Department of Revenue based off the Consumer Price Index. This annual cost of living adjustment determined by the DOR is already implemented on the exemption amount for our Clause 17D Senior Over 70 Exemption. Clause 22J would provide an additional exemption amount up to 100% of the amount of tax exemption granted to veterans on their domiciles under current veteran exemption clauses. One stipulation of Clause 22J, an additional exemption, is that it cannot reduce the taxes owed below what the taxpayer would owe on 10% of the current assessed value on their domicile. The voted percentage would continue to apply in sub subsequent years unless and until another percentage is voted on by this council. These changes cannot take effect until next year, fiscal 2026. The council order before you tonight will provide the maximum relief allowed under Massachusetts general laws for all veterans who qualify. In front of you tonight is the current exemption amounts and clauses that are accepted. While these amounts will increase, I do encourage anybody watching, I encourage anybody watching at home to review these exemptions to see if they do qualify. Our office is still taking exemption applications which are due by April 1st of next year. Clause 22 offers a $40 exemption uh, for veterans with a minimum of 10% service connection disability, veterans who award the Purple Heart, and surviving spouses of eligible veterans. Clause 22A offers a $750 exemption to disabled veterans who lost a hand, a foot, or an eye in the line of duty and veterans who received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Clause 22B offers a $1,250 exemption to disabled veterans who lost both hands, both feet, or both eyes in the line of duty. Clause 22C offers a $1,500 exemption to veterans who suffered 100% disability in the line of duty and require special adaptive housing. Clause 22E offers a $1,000 exemption to veterans who suffered 100% disability in the line of duty. For all these exemptions, spouses and surviving spouses of such veterans qualify. There are also three exemptions that offer a full property tax exemption for their veterans. Well, these clauses are not impacted by the two clauses presented tonight. I would like to highlight them as well. Clause 22D offers a full exemption for surviving spouses whose death was attributed to a service-connected injury or illness. Clause 22F, or the paraplegic clause, offers a full exemption to disabled veterans who are paraplegic veterans. Clause 22H offers a full exemption to surviving parents, gold star parents of veterans whose death was attributed to their service connection. The table presented before you shows how Clause 22I and Clause 22J would impact the veteran exemption amounts if they were applied for this year, fiscal 2025. Clause 22I, if accepted individually, would have increased the exemption amounts by 3.4%, which was the cost of living adjustment factor provided by the DOR this year. This COLA percentage was provided annually by the DOR, typically in March of April of each year. Clause 22J, if accepted individually, at 100% would have doubled the pre-existing exemption amounts. <coughs> Combined, the exemption amounts would first see the clause 22I cost of living adjustment, then that adjusted exemption amount would increase by the adopted clause 22J percentage of 100% 
maximizing the exemption amount for all eligible veterans and their families. From here, I'll pass the mic on to Eric to discuss the financial perspectives on the adoption of these clauses. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, so as uh, the Chairman said, uh, I'll be covering the financial perspective of the HEROES Act. Um, the HEROES Act from a financial standpoint really breaks down into two components, um, the cost of living increase and the increase in overall exemption. What's important to remember as we run through these numbers is that we will not be counting the current benefit costs since that's already locked in and the body's not deliberating on that tonight. So uh, we, from a financial perspective, uh, we just are including the uh, parts of the adopted law, or hopefully adopted law. Um, so the total costs between both programs will be $197,000 uh, for next year. Um, that's broken down to 191,000 is from uh, the 100% increase and the 65% and will be adjusted from the COLA. So to have that broken down, looking over the next uh, 10 years, th this program will cost uh, approximately $2.3 million over the next 10 years, which is obviously an average of about 230,000. Uh, the exemption will make up the largest proportional increase at approximately 68%, uh, with the COLA making up uh, less than a 2% shift, uh, and with current benefits being roughly about 32%. When we talk about the financial impact to the budget, I think that's, uh, you know, kind of, let's say that's largely my role as a finance director is to kind of weigh that out. Um, what's important is that while this is very, very, very impactful to veterans, as this body knows, um, the cost is relatively de minimis to the overall operations of the city itself. Um, we're looking at about, compared to the city budget, it's about a little less than five basis points of our entire budget, and it's less than seven basis points of our entire levy for, for those who may not be intertwined with the financial lexicon, a basis point is 1% of 1%. Um, so we actually create, have to create a new measurement to be able to talk about that. Um, it's important to remember is that the document, the budget that was already adopted by the council uh, for FY25 is unaffected by this. Um, this will be an FY26 appropriation. And what we will be presenting the council, if this is adopted in FY26, will be a specific line item within the budget uh, for the estimated cost of this program for that fiscal year, and then it will be transferred over to the overlay account. Uh, for those unfamiliar, the overlay account is the funds put aside that are reserved for abatements by the city, and they are administered by the assessor department. We we'll have an overview from the financial standpoint of this of this of you know, these two proposals, I should say is that given the city's current financial position and future financial positions, the HEROES Act does not pose um, anything you know, material to the operations of the city to adopt, despite it being very material to so many veterans in the city. We have 311 households that will be affected by this positively if adopted. Um, the financial impact is minimal. I will go into effect on the first, if adopted, the first quarter of 20. Uh, 26, fiscal year 2026, so that's July 1st for those who don't speak in fiscal years. Um, and it's important to remember all the data I put out here is on the projected current enrollment. As uh, the chairman said, and as uh, Chris Walker mentioned, you know, we encourage veterans to explore any options they have. Um, and I'm open to questions if the body so much wants, has any, and it's for station. Thanks, Eric. Our president recognizes Councillor Devine. Uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, very much to everybody that brought this up to uh, for to be looked at and voted on. Uh, when, when you say domicile, does does that mean um, where they're living? Like, uh, let's say a veteran's living with their parents, are they able to get this also, even if it's they not have there? to own and occupy the residence? Well, they do. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, maybe this is for um, the assessors. Off. I'm not sure who, who it necessarily should be directed towards, but I think this is a great program. I think it's it's something that definitely I'd love to see us uh, get rolling. Maybe maybe even Christine could could engage on it. But 
<clears throat> the outreach on this? Is this something that's automatically going to happen or is this something they have to apply for and how are we going to communicate to them? Because I think this is something that... The veteran exemptions do have to be applied for annually. Our office does mail out exemptions to everyone who applied last year and received the exemption. Mm -hmm. We also have the exemptions online available for anybody who wants to see them to review our website and anybody. we welcome anybody to come into our office, talk with our staff, call us up. We're happy to mail out an exemption to make sure everyone is getting it to take advantage of this. Mm -hmm. And is there, so is there a plan to proactively reach out to them? Maybe that is a better question for you. Do, do we have a, anything in place now that we're planning on? Because I, I could see this becoming, you know, something very important to, to outreach you. Yeah. Mr. President, we, we, we certainly will have a plan working with Christine. Um, I will note that this body uh, is, is very well ahead of the game in terms of other communities across the state. This doesn't take effect until the July 1st, 2025 tax bill. So we got some time uh, to work on some communication materials with the Veteran Services Department. And I would dare to say, you know, we don't want to get out too out in front now because people will then automatically assume that it's effective the, sure. when, when we set the tax rate in the fall, but it won't be effective until next year. Um, so I would say, you know, first of the calendar year or so, we probably mount um, a campaign with, with Christine's office and getting the word out as best we can uh, to our veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you for the presentation and um, the description and, and um, all the avenues of going with this. You know, that basically what it comes down to is the uh, Quincy City Council, the city of Quincy, you know, we prioritize veterans affairs and issues. And, and, and stated in here, um, that I'll also have access to behavioral health treatment, increasing benefits for disabled veterans and codifying medical and dental benefits. We've, we've, we've come a long way um, at the legislation um, in the state and, and to have it come down into the city of Quincy um, is important. And we've, we've done it within a few months here, a, a month or so of enactment. So um, happy to support this. Um, I know we, we have to uh, iron through where the funding's gonna come from and thank you for you guys for coming in here tonight and explaining that to the public uh, as well as the other counselors and, and the residents out there and our veterans. And this ultimately we're, we're, we're trying to give more benefits for them. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be quick. I just want to, um, following up to your point about those who are tuning in at home. So uh, folks who want to find out more about this program or really any program for abatement opportunities in the city of Quincy so they can reach out to your office, which is the assessor's office. Um, what's the phone number just really quick so that folks can- 617-376-1170. Great, and again, that's for any questions, application processes, follow up on any applications, et cetera, right? Absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, Council, I just wanna thank you for bringing this opportunity in front of us. I know, uh, like Mr. Walker said, when there's any opportunity to support veterans in our city, we always jump on it, and this is just another example of that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just a quick question. So this act just enabled us to fund the program. There's no funds that come from the state to support this program. This is a local option. So there's no additional state reimbursement on this. Got it. Okay. So uh, I'd be curious just real quick. Uh, what are some other sort of funding opportunities that came from this HEROES Act from the state? Or is it just sort of enablement of cities and towns to support through their own funding mechanisms? In terms of the exemptions, there are no additional state reimbursements for property tax exemptions, the motor vehicle exemptions, the changes in that are state reimbursed. Got it. Okay, great. And on that, happy to entertain a motion. Motion to approve, Councilor Lang, seconded by Councilor DeBona. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Ash. Yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Minton. Yes. President King. Yes. Nine members. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Clerk, next item, please. Number two, 2024-113, Ordinance Amending Municipal Code, Chapter 274, Sex Offenders. The President recognizes Councilor Ash. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this um, is an amendment to our, the, the city's ordinance on the books from 2009. Um, and uh, essentially, um, the ordinance as as drafted and at 
you know, at the time we were one of, again, the first municipalities even thinking about this issue on a local level and, and putting the ordinance and drafting the ordinance and adopting it. So um, certainly um, kudos to the council at that time. Um, I did note, I did notice um, earlier this year that um, the ordinance as drafted really gave a lot of discretion to property owners and property managers um, and gave those property owners and managers the discretion to move um, registered sex offenders into properties uh, with little recourse. Um, so the language here, um, which I'm happy to go over each, each of the changes, but the main um, differentiation between this amendment and what we have as a city on the books right now is that property owners and managers for elderly um, housing um, establishments really that we how this is drafted the property manager or owner would need to notify all of the residents um, and also um, obtain approval from the Quincy Police Department before allowing tenancy um, by a level two or three registered sex offender um, in addition to that the fines um, have been have increased um, as well as what um, the city is allowed to do for enforcement. So um, I wanted to bring this forward. Um, I think especially with an ordinance 15, 15 years old, um, it was good to look at it and really see how we can move forward and protect seniors um, and the vulnerable, vulnerable population um, from, uh, and also schools. Um, so uh, I, I welcome any questions um, or discussion on this amendment. Uh, but really, the, the main uh, premise of it is to for the city to have some control over elderly housing uh, establishments and whether tenancies are allowed uh, for level two and three registered sex offenders. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I know when Councilor Ash um, have put this into motion, um, we had done a, a coffee hour at the Senior Citizens uh, 1000 Southern Artery and they, they spoke about it. So, you know, basically this ordinance improves the health, safety and welfare of our citizens and really protects our senior citizens and children from sex offenders. And the enforcement part of it, um, the registered sex offenders uh, is, 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 is pointed really both basically to protect our schools, our libraries, our daycare centers, parks, recreational facilities, elder housing, elder housing, housing school bus stops as well as public transportation bus stops and facilities. I know there's some posting in this um, in this order as well, um, this ordinance um, 274-4A, um, which allows um, the permanent bulletin boards of level two and level three sex offenders to be posted at Quincy City Hall, Quincy Police Department, Thomas Crane Library, and the administrative area of every public school and every public daycare facility. I am I'm glad we're revisiting this after 15 years. Um, just as um, uh, folks, um, uh, the world has changed. <laughs> and um, revisiting this and, and putting this into some type of amendment and ordinance here in the city of Quincy is important. So um, at the end of the day, it's, it's protecting our citizens as well as our elderly, our senior citizens, and our, and our children. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Wong. Councilor Liang. <laughs> Thank you. I think, um, you know, any and all laws are always up for uh, updating, right? And something as old as 15 years, I think, certainly could use it. So thank you again for bringing something in front of us for a good discussion. This should be going into Ordinance Committee for discussion before we approve those. So I'd like to make a motion to move this to Ordinance. Motion to approve. Motion to move to Ordinance. Do I have a second? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. Councilor Okay. Uh, Madam Clerk, next item, please. Number three, 2024 114, a gift for $700 for various donors from Deer in memory of Sergeant John Bryan. Motion approved, made by Councilor Devon, seconded by Councilor McCarthy. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Ash. Yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Devine. Yes. Councilor Devonna. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Minton. Yes. President Kane. Yes. Nine members. Thank you. Next item, please. Number four, 2024 115, a gift for $50 from Heather Sargent for Police Officers Assistant Program. Uh, motion to approve made by Councilor DeBonis, seconded by Councilor McCarthy. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Ash. Yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. 
Council Devine. Yes. Council Devon. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Minton. Yes. President King. Yes. Nine members. Thank you, Madam Clerk. That concludes our regularly scheduled agenda items. Approval of previous meeting minutes. Motion approved made by Councilor Yang, seconded by Councilor Campbell. All those in favor? Those opposed? Ayes have it. Communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers and city boards, seeing none. Unfinished business and preceding meeting, seeing none. Reports of committees, seeing none. Presentation of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. Councilor Ash. I'd uh, like to take a moment um, and mention the uh, and, and pay tribute to Leo J. Del Vecchio. Um, Mr. Del Vecchio, the Del Vecchio family is um, a very uh, is a large, well-known family in Penns Hill. Um, they uh, they seemingly they almost monopolize a, a couple of streets up there, and they're uh, a wonderful family, great people to know. Uh, Mr. Leo J. Del Vecchio passed away on Saturday, September 14th at age 86. Um, he was born in Quincy. Um, and he graduated from Quincy High Trade School, class of 1956. Uh, Mr. Del Vecchio was an associate of the American Society of Plumbing Engineers for over 20 years um, after working at Norfolk Mechanical of Weymouth for about eight years. He was a lifelong active parishioner at St. John the Baptist Church in Quincy, where he volunteered for the food pantry. Um, along with his wife, Marilyn, Leo ran the South Shore Bank Golf League at the Rockland Golf Course for many years. He enjoyed crafts and puzzles, was an avid reader, enjoyed gardening and working on his home, as well as many trips to Disney World over the years. Uh, beloved husband for 63 years of Marilyn A. D'Angelo Del Vecchio, um, devoted father to Leanne Arthur and her husband Paul of Marshfield, Michelle Bickford and her husband Fred of Norwell, um, grandfather to many, and um, I really want to extend my condolences to the Del Vecchio family and mention um, for all interested in paying their respects, um, visiting hours are Friday, um, September 20th from 4 to 7 at Dolan Funeral Home in East, in East Milton and a mass of Christian burial at St. John's 44 School Street Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ash. Okay, uh, motions, motions, orders, and resolutions. Seeing none, uh, scheduling of committee meetings and public hearings. Our next meetings will be on Monday, October 7th. We have a utility public hearing at 6.30, followed by an ordinance committee meeting at 6.45, followed by a regular city council meeting at 7.30 p.m. On that, I'll entertain motion to adjourn made by Councilor Liang, seconded by Councilor Von. All those in favor? Those opposed? Have a good night. <laughs>